Welcome back, everyone, to my final reaction to Caesar in Gaul by Kings and Generals. I hope you guys have enjoyed this series. We're going to get through the end of the video today. Uh, as always, if you have not seen the first several videos of my reaction to this series, there's a link in the description below that will take you back to the beginning. Also, please make sure to check out Kings and Generals. It's a fantastic channel. It's one of my favorite on YouTube. They also happen to subscribe to our channel now. So I was pretty excited when I saw that. And uh, so we want to make sure that we're giving them credit uh, for all the hard work that they put into this series. So there's a link in the description to their original video. Make sure you subscribe, hit like, and support them all you can. Let's dive right in to part four. However, he reacted quickly, marching directly to the besieged legion in Nervii territory, while Labienus fought off the Indutiomarus. Upon seeing Caesar approaching, Ambiorix gave up the siege to face this new threat and was quickly defeated, while almost simultaneously Labienus was able to successfully repel his opponents. Roman retribution for this revolt was swift and devastating. The Eburones were effectively wiped out, while Ambiorix, according to some sources, left Gaul for Germania. So that sounds really harsh uh, with a 21st century mind looking back and thinking, man, uh, these people are just fighting for the freedom. You come along and you wipe them out in retaliation. But you have to think of the mindset of the occupying force as the Romans here. We don't want other people to think they can do this. So we're going to send a message to any other potential threats to our rule. If you rise up against us, you may achieve temporary success, but we will come back with a vengeance. We will bring our might upon you and we will destroy you. So he's sending that message. Do not think about doing this. To help stabilize the situation, Pompey mobilized two more legions and Caesar himself raised another. He now had almost 50,000 men in Gaul under his command. However, this was only the prelude to something much bigger. In 52 BC, Caesar returned to Italy in order to defuse another political problem, and in the same year, another large-scale revolt started. An Arverni leader, Vercingetorix, who probably knew about the political problems in Rome, had organized an alliance of powerful Gallic tribes that, inspired by Ambiorix, were now seeking independence and had begun attacking Roman outposts and Roman allies in Gaul. Now, this is a guy, uh, and you'll hear me pronounce it, Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix, I'm not sure what would be the pro proper pronunciation. He may be right about that. It's just the way I've always said it. Um, but this is a guy that, to this day, you can go to south-central France, and you will see statues to this man. He is well-remembered for a guy that you know lived over 2,000 years ago and ultimately was defeated by Caesar. Uh, he is highly regarded and well remembered amongst all of these Gallic tribes. There's probably nobody uh, better known than Vercingetorix. Upon hearing this, Caesar quickly returned to Gaul to handle the situation. Going on one of his famous forced marches, he swiftly quelled the Senones and Carnutes by taking their capitals. His next target was one of the largest towns of the Baturiges, Novia Dunum. Vercingetorix attempted to stop Caesar's advance near the city, but the Roman heavy infantry was too much for the Gauls and they were forced to retreat, losing many, which allowed Caesar to take the city. To finish off the Baturiges, he needed to take their capital, Avaricum. At this point, Vercingetorix started employing scorched earth tactics and the Baturiges joined him by burning down 20 of their towns, every one but Avaricum. The Romans moved against this settlement and besieged it, and although Avaricum was very defensible and Vercingetorix attempted to help its defenders, it fell in less than a month. Caesar slaughtered 40,000 locals and replenished his supplies. 40,000! I mean, his army isn't much larger than that. These are just... You know, it's it's difficult to kind of comprehend this, but you know the town I live in is forty thousand people. You know, imagining an invading force coming in and just wiping out the entire town. Uh, it may not seem like a big deal if we're talking about the grand scheme of things in the Roman Empire, but to this part of uh, of Gaul, this is you know generations wiped out at one time. 
it was clear for Vercingetorix that he couldn't beat the Romans in the field. Meanwhile, Caesar was eager to end the rebellion before it could spread to other Gallic tribes, so he decided to strike the decisive blow by taking the capital of the Arverni, Gergovia. Leaving some troops in the area, Caesar marched with 25,000 towards this settlement, while Vercingetorix shadowed him. Gigovia was in a very solid defensive position, located on top of a high plateau, and Vercingetorix managed to overtake Caesar and positioned his army on the hills in front of the city. As he had done in previous battles, Caesar hoped to cut his enemy's supply lines in order to force them out of their defensive position, whilst he would be receiving supplies from the Aedui, his Gallic allies. So once again, as a general, you want to try and shape the circumstances of the battle to favor you. You know, the, the Gauls here that he's facing have the high ground, they've got the defensive position. You want to force them out of that into a battle of your choosing rather than attacking them where they are ready and, and ready to fight. However, the Gauls had occupied a hill overlooking the supply line from where they could ensure water and grain could be transported into the city. Taking it would therefore be crucial to Caesar's plan. In a quick night attack, he was able to dislodge the Gallic garrison there and station two legions on the hill linking this position with the main Roman camp by a trench. So far, all was going according to plan. Once again, you see the brilliance of Caesar constantly using engineers and using fortifications. He builds a trench. You know, he doesn't mess around. This is like an overnight thing. He, he instantly, whenever he's into a position where he's fighting, he instantly tries to shape the ground around him as favorable as possible. Caesar's allies would supply him from the rear, and Vercingetorix would now be forced to either sacrifice his defensive position in order to re-establish his supply line, or be starved out. However, Vercingetorix had his own plans. He bribed the Aedui, who then also joined the revolt, attacking the Roman supplies and threatening to cut off Caesar and surround him. Once again, Vercingetorix seems to have studied Rome's tactics deeply, as this strategy was one of Caesar's own favorite strategies. Mm -hmm. Caesar was forced to leave two legions to guard the Roman position at Gergovia, and took the other four to deal with the Aedui. Quick so he's got, he's had a total of 50,000 men. He's already divided his force in half by sending half of them up to the north to deal with what's going on there. Now he's dividing his force even further. This is exactly what you want as the Gauls, is to split him into three, and now you can take on a little piece at a time. ...subduing them and forcing them to send 10,000 cavalry back to the siege with him. This revolt had Caesar worried that he might face even more revolts, and could soon be encircled by the rebels. He needed to extract his legions from Gogovia and consolidate his troops. However, the situation at the city was not looking good. The two legions left to guard the Roman camp had been hard pressed the entire time Caesar had been gone. Furthermore, Vercingetorix had divided his forces leaving half to defend and fortify the main Gallic camp in front of the city, and half, led by himself, to fortify positions on the surrounding hills on the Gallic right flank. With a six-foot wall now in front of the main Gallic camp and the Gallic fortifications on the hills, Vercingetorix had removed any opportunity for Caesar to encircle him and the city. So you can see Vercingetorix using a lot of the same tactics that Caesar does. And this is what a smart enemy will do. He'll learn what you do well. He'll imitate that and hopefully implement it as well as you have. And so he is putting himself in a position where he can best defend his people against what he knows is going to be a very difficult enemy. Seeing the Gallic forces divided, Caesar saw an opportunity to attack their main camp in order to deal a heavy enough blow to allow his army to retreat unmolested. He sent a diversionary force of one legion and some cavalry to the surrounding hills, making a huge amount of noise in order to distract the force commanded by Vercingetorix. 
Then he quickly and quietly moved his remaining legions up to the Gallic camp, leaving a few cohorts in the smaller camp on the occupied hill, while the Aedui cavalry were sent to flank around the Gallic left by another route. The Romans quickly clambered over the wall and fell upon the Gallic camp. The Romans initially had significant success, pushing the Gauls right up to the walls of the city, but Caesar ordered a withdrawal before the rest of the Gallic force under Vercingetorix could reinforce them. Mm. However, only one legion, the 10th, heard this order and retreated, Oops. the others continuing to press on and assaulting the city itself. Some Romans managed to climb on top of the city walls, but were quickly cut down and thrown back off. Mm. Missiles from the city walls fell into the Roman ranks as they fought around the base of the walls. Vercingetorix, realizing what was happening from his position on the surrounding hills, sent the rest of his force, headed by his cavalry, to reinforce the camp. Mm. The Roman position was now truly desperate. Now, what do you do if you're Caesar in this situation? I would think that you have to go in and you have to hit Vercingetorix before he can surround and destroy a couple of legions. You've got to do something. You can't, you know, at this point, things have not gone the way that you anticipated or wanted, but you really have no choice. The initial Gallic force and the city walls were in front of them. There was no way of cutting a way out by pushing forward. And with Vercingetorix crashing into their flank, the legionaries were under serious pressure and were almost surrounded. The officers did their best to maintain Roman discipline and form a defensive formation. According to Caesar himself, 46 centurions died in this struggle, mm. roughly a quarter of all the centurions present, and so maintaining any solid formation was almost impossible. So 46 centurions, your centurions are basically your company commanders. Uh, so that's a big deal. That's a lot of your kind of middle uh, officer corps. Uh, and it would be very difficult to maintain discipline and order in a ordered retreat, uh, trying to fall back under overwhelming forces, losing those men. The Adui finally appeared on a hill to the Roman right flank, but the Romans, unable to tell if they were allied or not, broke completely, mm. thinking that they were about to be fully surrounded. Caesar was able to use the 10th Legion and the cohort that had been stationed in the small camp to cover the retreat, and prevented the Gauls from chasing them down, avoiding the total destruction of his army, and withdrew from the field. In his commentaries, Caesar says that only 700 men were lost in this battle, but this is likely vastly underplaying the situation. Caesar being forced to assemble a rearguard and retreating shows how disastrous the battle was. And you know, if he lost 46 centurions, it is difficult to believe that he only lost 700 men, uh, though it's certainly possible. It's also possible he lost more than 46 centurions and he was downplaying that too. And it is likely that the Romans lost thousands, modern estimates suggesting as many as 6,000. While Caesar was fighting a losing battle against Vercingetorix at Cagovia, his best legate, Titus Labienus, was sent to deal with rebellions in northern Gaul. Local Gauls, emboldened by Vercingetorix and led by Camulogenus, were consolidating around modern Paris, which was called Lutetia at that time, and was the capital of the Parisii. Labienus had left a legion near Agadincum in order to have a supply line to Caesar and marched with four more legions towards Lutetia. His troops took Metlosidum along the way, but their attempts to cross the river Seine were blocked by Camulogenus. Labienus was forced to retreat back to Metlosidum. Luckily for him, his scouts had found another crossing near Metlosidum. He crossed there and moved against the Gauls. However, Camulogenus used Vercingetorix's scorched earth tactic, burning Lutetia and retreating to the swamps beyond. At the same time, Labienus learned about Caesar's defeat at Gagovia, which provoked a big Gallic tribe called Belevecchi, led by Corius, to rebel, so he knew that he had to retreat beyond the Seine and unite with his legion in Agadincum. 
none of this is looking good right now. I mean, this seems like a losing battle. And honestly, I would probably go back to the invasion of Britain and say, you know, in hindsight, maybe you overstretched a little bit. Maybe you went a little too far. Maybe you should have just worried about holding on to what you had already taken. We talk all the time about going too far, although usually you can't see that until years later when you look back and you can point to that moment and say, that's where they went too far. In Caesar's case, it all works out in the end, but you could say that about Britain. Labienus's decision to divide his forces into three provoked Camulogenus into attacking him to the south of Lutetia without waiting for the Bellovaci. And in the ensuing battle, the Romans used the fact that their divided forces were closer to each other. Each group supported the other, and the legions managed to defeat the Gauls with ease. Camulogenus was killed in the process, which slowed down the consolidation of the anti-Roman rebellion in northern Gaul. Caesar and Labienus both retreated towards Agadincum, where they united their forces. Meanwhile, more and more Gauls were joining the rebellion, and after the rest of the Adui joined it, even the Roman province of Narbonensis was attacked by them. Caesar and his ten legions moved through the Sequani and Linganese territory to the east, in order to gain a line of retreat to the Roman province of Gallia Transalpina. So just to give you a kind of a sense of what we're talking about here, you can see there there's Geneva in modern day Switzerland, uh, Alicia is right here, which is what we're going to be talking about here soon. Uh, and you can kind of see on the map the areas where we're talking about. And there's so much history here that goes back. So, you know, when we think of uh, Western Europe, we think of the battlefields of World War One and World War Two, But the battlefields of Europe are so much more ancient than that. And there's so much history here. At the same time, Caesar's envoys secured a group of Germanic mercenaries who joined the Roman cavalry. Vercingetorix and his 80,000 tried to attack Caesar when the latter was trying to cross the Vingiani River, but the Romans were able to stop the attack with ease. It is not clear why, but this minor defeat either disheartened Vercingetorix or showed him that he couldn't win against the Romans in an open battle, so he probably tried to recreate the factors that led to the victory at Gagovia when he retreated to the Mandubii capital of Alesia. Here we go. Caesar followed him to the settlement. This is a crazy battle. Siege. Alicia was a well-defended city on a hill, and Vercingetorix sent messages to his nearby allies to come to his aid. Vercingetorix was in a strong position. He outnumbered Caesar, commanding a force of up to 80,000 men, and... And conventional wisdom, at least in later history, is that you don't lay siege to a superior force. And in fact, you typically want to have something like a three to one advantage if you're going to lay siege to a city or a fortified position. Caesar is going to lay siege to an army that outnumbers his. So fascinating stuff. Was surrounded by allies who would be able to quickly send men to reinforce him. From his position, it should be a simple rerun of Gogovia. He would wait on the high ground for his allies to arrive so they could either disrupt the Roman supply lines or attack them in the rear. Caesar had learnt his lesson though. Despite his smaller numbers, he immediately began the work of fully surrounding and besieging Alesia, something which Vercingetorix had been able to prevent him doing at Gogovia. The Romans began constructing a 16-kilometer wall, fully encircling the entire city, complete with palisades, trenches, and towers, hoping to cut off any escape. So here in this case, Caesar's not going to attack. He's not going to hurl his men at a superior enemy. He's going to starve them out. Uh, a 16-kilometer wall. I mean, that's a pretty substantial fortification, and it's only the first one he's going to have to build. Vercingetorix sent his cavalry out to try and disrupt these works, but the legions were able to form a defensive line to hold them, while the German auxiliaries flanked around the side. The Germans proved to be vital to the Roman cause, and their superior horsemanship forced the Gallic cavalry to retreat back into the city, killing many as they were funneled into the narrow gates. Realizing that he would soon be completely surrounded, Vercingetorix decided to send out what was left of his cavalry at night to sneak past the Roman line and head to the nearby tribes to request reinforcements as soon as possible. 
Upon completing the first wall, Caesar learned from some Gallic deserters that these messengers had been sent, and so constructed a second wall, this one almost 21 kilometers long and complete with two trenches and a moat facing outwards to protect against any Gallic reinforcements, creating a donut-like structure with Alicia in the center. Can you, th maybe there's other times in history where this kind of thing has happened. I can't think of a substantial example of a army besieging a larger force than they have. And then in anticipation of being themselves surrounded, building a second set of entrenchments and full kind of works around themselves and then actually winning in a situation like this. This is one of the reasons why Caesar goes down in history. He next sent out huge foraging parties to collect enough food to sustain his troops for the next 30 days. Yep, important in doing stuff this, there too. Caesar had effectively robbed Vercingetorix of his advantages. With the Romans thus defended and supplied, it was the Gauls who now faced a well dug in enemy, and it was now Vercingetorix whose time was running out. With an army of 80,000 men inside the city, plus the civilian population and no way of resupplying, it was only a matter of time before he was starved out. This was Caesar's magnum opus. Faced with a desperate situation, Vercingetorix made the difficult decision to expel anyone who wasn't going to be fighting. The old, the sick, women and children. Can't he had them. hoped that Caesar would allow these people through the Roman defences and to safety. But Caesar was nope. not in a merciful mood. He refused to let them pass, and the civilians were left between the walls of Alicia and the Romans. In so, I mean, what are you going to do as Caesar? Of course you want him to be stuck with these people. It makes his situation more untenable. He's got to feed them. He's got to protect them. Uh, this only increases the chances that Vercingetorix is going to have to surrender his army. So it makes sense that Caesar would say no to that. Imploring both sides for food and water, neither side relenting. Over the next few days, many died of starvation and thirst, the space between the armies becoming full of the dying and dead. The Gallic allies finally arrived to try and relieve the siege, under the command of Vercingetorix's cousin, the Cassivellaunus. It is hard to say precisely how many there were. Caesar claims that the number was as high as 250,000, with modern estimates suggesting somewhere between 70 and 100,000. Still, that's still a lot of people, and that's still more than Caesar has. So again, He's besieging 80,000 inside the city. He's besieged by 100,000 outside the city. This looks like a death sentence for Caesar and his army. It's an incredible feat that he gets out of this. Whatever the true number was, all agree that the Romans were now significantly outnumbered, at least two to one. On the first day of their arrival, they quickly filled in the first Roman trench and sent across a combined force of light infantry and cavalry to probe the defences, whilst the rest of the army set up camp. Caesar countered by sending out his own Germanic cavalry and a fierce skirmish ensued. From their elevated position inside the city, the besieged Gauls saw that their allies had arrived and simultaneously began massing for a sally against the inner fortifications. And this is what you have to do if you're the Gauls, right? You outnumber him two to one. You've got to throw everything you've got at him all at once. That's the only way that you can be successful in this situation. However, the Germans once again proved their skill, outmaneuvering and flanking their Gallic counterparts, forcing them back across the trench and into the Gallic camp. Seeing his allies defeated, Vercingetorix decided to bide his time and held off his attack. The reinforcements spent the next day constructing siege ladders, and then, at midnight, launched another attack. Taking the Romans by surprise, they found some initial success, but Mark Antony, in his first battle, was commanding this section of the wall and proved himself to be a composed and skillful lieutenant, pulling troops from other sections of the walls to reinforce his position. Again, Vercingetorix began to sally out to try and help his allies, but was delayed by having to fill the Roman trench. 
by the time he had crossed it, Antony had successfully fought off the assault, and Vercingetorix again withdrew into the city. Following these two failed assaults, Vercesivalanus conducted more thorough reconnaissance of the Roman position, and discovered that a steep hill overlooked the Roman wall in the northern section. Hoping to use this high ground to his advantage, the next day the Gauls used their overwhelming numbers to attack the entire length of the outside wall. So that's what you have to do. Again, you have to use your overwhelming numbers, you've got to use your superior might, and you've got to focus it somewhere where you have the best chance of breaking through and changing the outcome. But concentrated a larger force under Vercassivellanus on this portion. At the same time, Vercingetorix again sallied out, this time attacking the length of the interior Roman fortifications, hitting wherever looked weakest. This was the toughest the fighting had been so far. Caesar, as he had done at the Battle of Sabis, dashed from cohort to cohort, urging his men on, leading reserve cohorts personally to points where the defences looked like they were faltering. Vicassivellanus began making headway, piling earthworks up against the walls in order to mount them, and using hooks and siege engines to tear down the Roman defences. Caesar committed every man he had left of his reserves, pulling every man who could be spared and sending them into the action. Look at this, I mean, it's fighting everywhere, and if any one of these places, one side breaks, it can turn the tide of the battle, because you could have a domino effect. Let's say that the, uh, the Romans break over here, over here, over here. Well, now all of a sudden you shorten that line, and the shorter that line gets, uh, the easier it is for the overwhelming numbers uh, of the Gauls to be able to start breaking you. So you've got to win everywhere. It was a desperate battle for the Romans. Between the two walls, there would be no escape, and if the line faltered, the entire army would surely be wiped out. The Roman line was holding the Gallic army, but it seemed like it wouldn't last for long. But then, Caesar appeared at the top of the hill. Leading the Germanic auxiliaries, he crashed into the rear of the Gallic reinforcements. Surrounded now on all sides, the Gauls who had pushed through the breach were decimated and the tide of battle changed. Seeing their largest contingent broken, the morale of the rest of the Gallic reinforcements shattered and they quickly fled. With this threat thus neutralized, the Romans turned to deal with Vercingetorix who was attacking the interior wall and they were able to force him back into the city. With the city still besieged and his reinforcements spent, Vercingetorix surrendered. It is unknown how many Romans died, but the casualties must have been fairly significant given the intensity of the fighting, oh, yeah. particularly at the point where the fortifications had been breached. The Gallic relief force suffered heavy casualties, the entirety of the besieged army in Alesia was either killed or enslaved, and both Vercassivellanus and Vercingetorix were taken alive. So let's take a look real quick at the numbers and see what the modern historical estimates are on the casualties on either side for this. So right here, we're looking at uh, an estimate of 12,800 killed and wounded for Caesar's forces and 250,000 killed on the side of the Gauls. I mean, this is just outstanding numbers. Uh, you've got estimates that the enemy uh, was as high as 400,000. Um, now, this is kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, Caesar's the one who says 250,000 killed and 40,000 captured. Uh, modern estimates are saying that there were less than 70,000. I don't think those numbers are accurate at all. Uh, I think they were much higher than that, though I think they're probably less than what Caesar reports. Uh, but either way, this is an incredible victory for Caesar. Uh, and cements his legacy as one of the great generals of all time. And of course, Vercingetorix after this is captured. He's uh, held for the rest of his life as a captive by Caesar. Eventually Caesar has this triumph, which is a basically a big um, parade in Rome. And at the end of the parade, they strangle Vercingetorix. Some reports say that he was then beheaded, but he was strangled to death in front of the Roman mob, basically. Um, so uh, kind of an undignified end to a guy who had stood up to Caesar so nobly. And uh, if you've ever watched the HBO series 
uh, Rome, which went for two seasons, it begins, the very first episode begins with Vercingetorix's surrender to Caesar and going into captivity. Although most of the rebel leaders were either dead or captured, the resistance against Rome was far from over, as the Paterigis, Carnutes, Belovecchi, Atrebates, Anticavi and others were still in open rebellion. In January of 51 BC, Caesar moved against the Paterigis. This winter campaign surprised the Paterigis, who were probably unprepared for it, and soon they sued for peace, which allowed Caesar to return to his winter quarters. However, soon the Paterigis were attacked by the Carnutes for yielding to the Romans. Once again, Caesar marched swiftly and took his enemies by surprise, forcing the Carnutes to submit. The Romans made new winter quarters at Cenabum and stayed there until the spring. Leaving six legions in the area, Caesar took four and moved against the Bellovaci of Corius and the Atrebates of Commius. This campaign proved difficult, as both tribes abandoned their lands and fought a guerrilla war against the Romans. Fortunately for the legions, Corius was killed in one of the ambushes, which proved to be the final straw for the Bellovaci. They were convinced to seek peace, while Commius retreated to the east to continue his resistance. To the south, the Andicavi attacked Liminum and were defeated by Caesar's lieutenants. The remainder of the Gallic forces in the area attempted to defend at Uxiladunum, but were defeated by Caesar soon after. The last engagement of the war saw Commius defeated in the north, and the rebellion was over. Gaul was pacified, and Caesar won over the remaining Gallic leaders with gifts and the promise of lower tribute. He knew that the battle for Rome was about to start. Yep. The civil war that would end the centuries-long republic was just around the corner. Thus ends the first season of our series on Gaius Julius Caesar. But he will be back for the second season, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. So yeah, definitely make sure you subscribe to their channel. A lot of great stuff. We are going to continue our conversation about Caesar because uh, honestly the part of uh, Roman history that I know the most about and that I find myself the most interested in is that period beginning with the end of the Gallic Wars running up through the the empire which uh, takes place under uh, Caesar's grandnephew uh, Octavian who or Octavius I guess was his real name um, uh, who becomes known as Caesar Augustus. So that's kind of my, the most fascinating time to me, those civil wars. So we're going to definitely talk more about that in the future. But let me know your thoughts. Uh, if you have other suggestions of things you'd like to see, we'll probably put another vote up very soon for the uh, for the patrons uh, to vote on. This was the one they overwhelmingly chose to see. So I'd be curious to see what you guys have to say next. Use the comment section below. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.